In this video, we're going to be talking about blood spatter. And yes, I said spatter and not splatter because the name is blood spatter, and it's a great way to tell that a TV program didn't do their research when you hear someone say splatter. So the meaning of blood spatter pattern was not actually analyzed until 1939. Before that, we recognized that blood was falling in these patterns, but we really didn't think you could tell much from them, and now we know much better. So where do blood spatter patterns come from? They come when a wound is inflicted. Anytime someone bleeds, they have the potential to create a spatter pattern. It does take a grouping of blood stains to make a blood spatter pattern. And that pattern can help to reconstruct the events surrounding a shooting, stabbing, beating, or any other sort of event where someone may have bled. Now, when it comes to the analysis of blood spatter, we can determine the direction that the blood traveled, the angle of impact, the point of origin of the blood, the velocity of blood, and sometimes even the manner of death, which surprises students. Even if we don't have a body, if we have enough blood, we might be able to figure out how that person died. Now, on our next slides, we're gonna go through some different types of spatter patterns. So as one of the things that happens when blood falls is it creates two things called spikes and satellites. So when blood falls from a height or a high velocity, it can overcome its natural cohesiveness and form satellite droplets. And those are these little droplets that have escaped the overall pattern. This is compared to what blood also forms, which is called spiking patterns. And this is when the drops have these rough edges. Notice that they're still connected to the main drop, but they do not, blood does not create smooth circles when it falls. These characteristics influence all the blood spatter patterns we are able to create. So up first we have our passive patterns. And our first passive pattern is the passive drop, and these are blood stain drops created or formed by the force of gravity acting alone. And you can see that spike and satellite that I just talked about here. So this might be someone standing there bleeding or standing there holding a knife that blood is dripping off of, but it usually indicates that someone is staying relatively still, hence passive. This is compared to a drip pattern which is a blood stain pattern which results from blood dripping into blood. So once again, someone or something is staying still, so, but the blood is landing in the exact same place every time. So for example, if blood was on a table and it was dripping over the edge of a table, every time the blood would hit the floor, it's going to land in the same place and it's gonna cause that overspray that you're seeing around the edges. Then we have our flow pattern. A flow pattern is a change in shape and direction of a blood stain due to the influence of gravity or movement of the object. So we often see flow patterns when blood either hits a wall, like you see in this picture here, and then the blood flows down the wall. You also can see it um, in car accidents as people hit the brakes, hence the movement of the object part. Next, we can have what is called a pool, and this is a blood stain pattern created when a source of blood remains stationary over a surface, causing an accumulation of blood. So the most common example of this is when someone is bleeding out, they're laying perfectly still because they probably can't move, and they continue to bleed, so a pool of blood forms around the body, but it's just a large accumulation of blood. Continuing with our passive patterns, this one is a little tricky, but it is a saturation, and this is a blood stain pattern created when a volume of blood has been absorbed by an object. So you can see in here, blood has been absorbed by a t-shirt, but it could be a pillow, a blanket, anything that's absorptive. Saturations are difficult because the pattern really can, looks different depending on what side you're on, so it makes it difficult to tell what happened. Moving on to our next category of patterns, we have our transfer patterns. And the first one is called the transfer contact pattern. And this is a blood stain pattern created when a wet bloody surface comes in contact with a second surface. 
A recognizable image of all or a portion of the original surface may be observed in the pattern. So in our picture here, you can see that this is clearly the ball of someone's shoe. They must have walked through blood and then walked somewhere else. So this is very helpful for multiple reasons. One, shoe prints are helpful, as we will discuss later in this class. Um, but also, we can tell that the blood was already wherever this person stepped and in order for them to step through it. So likely, whatever event occurred has already happened. Then we have our swipe pattern, and this is the transfer of blood from a moving source onto an unstained surface. Direction of travel may be determined from the feather edge. We can see that this is likely a hand. You can see the um, three larger fingers and the pinky. We are missing the thumb. And you can tell that it started in that upper left-hand corner of the picture and then went down towards the bottom right because the blood is thicker up at the top. As, in, as it moves down towards the bottom, it feathers out, which is what that's talking about. So this is a clean surface and then a bloody object touching that clean surface. This is compared to the wipe pattern, which is a blood stain pattern created when an object moves through an existing stain, removing or altering its um, appearance. So in a wipe, we already had passive drops, in this case, on the surface, and then someone, once again, this is likely a hand, disturbed the pattern. But you can still faintly see the original pattern. Once again, this helps us really establish a timeline of when things occurred. Moving on to our projected impact spatters. Up first, we have arterial spurting. And this is a blood stain pattern that results from the body of blood exiting the body under high pressure from a breached artery, hence the name. You have some arteries in your body that are pretty accessible, like in your neck um, and leg. And thus, if in some sort of fight or something, they become breached, the pressure causes blood to exit the body very quickly and results in a large volume of blood hitting a surface at one time. Now you can see in this picture, this is our arterial spurt, but we're starting to get that flow pattern because this is a wall. So a lot of times blood patterns can coexist at the same time. Next we have our cast off pattern, and this is created when blood is released or thrown from a blood bearing object. So for example, if someone was hitting somebody else with a baseball bat, every time they swung the bat, blood would be thrown from that bat, creating this kind of straight droplet line of blood that you see in the picture. And that would happen with each consecutive swing of the bat. This can also be seen happening with knives. This is an example of expirated blood, and this is blood that is blown out of the nose, mouth, or a wound as the result of air pressure and or airflow as the propelling force. The big thing you are looking for in this is you can see these little bubbles that are occurring. That is from the air getting trapped inside the blood, and that is what makes expirated blood unique. This is low velocity impact spatter. And this is a blood stain pattern that is caused by a low velocity impact or force to a blood source. So a lot of times this is someone who has experienced some sort of other in um, injury and then is actively bleeding. That is compared to medium velocity impact spatter, which is a blood stain pattern caused by a medium velocity impact or force to a blood source. And a beating is typically what causes medium velocity impact spatter. You can see the difference as we move from low to medium, that we see individual droplets now, and they are much more spread out, but the droplets are still all very clearly visible. And this is compared to, you guessed it, high velocity impact spatter, which is a blood stain pattern caused by a high velocity impact or force to a blood source. And this is often produced by a gunshot or high-speed machinery. Now you can see here, we can barely see individual blood droplets anymore. The blood has become very small and very spread out. And this is because the high velocity has caused the blood to almost vaporize. Now we have a few miscellaneous patterns to also discuss. This here is a void, and this is um, an absence of stain in an otherwise continuous blood stain pattern. 
And this indicates that a person or object was in the way of the blood spatter and was later moved. So in this picture here, you can see we have the void right here. It's this blank spot. And if we look closely, we can tell that this is likely a wrench. It has a handle and then it has this crescent shaped top. So we know the wrench was there when this, this looks like high velocity impact spatter to me, when likely a gunshot occurred, but then someone picked up the wrench and moved it. Why? Can we find that wrench somewhere else in the house? Probably has good fingerprints on it. Or did that person take the wrench with them? If they took the wrench with them, why? What was so important about it? So voids can help us establish a chain of events, but often bring up a lot of questions for us about why someone would move something. Then we have skeletonized stains, and this is a blood stain consisting of a darkened peripheral rim where the center of the stain is no longer intact. Intact. So blood dries from the outside inward, and that's because the outside of a blood droplet is the thinnest and the inside is the thickest part. So it dries outside in, which means if blood dries for a little bit and then someone tries to clean it up, a lot of times you get these skeletonized stains or if they move through it, such as through a wipe. Now we talked earlier in this video about how we can determine a lot from these patterns. And one of those things was directionality. And that's because the shape of an individual drop of blood provides clues to the direction where the blood originated from. We are asked, how will the point of impact compare to the rest of the blood pattern? The point of impact is going to be the thickest part of the pattern. You can see here, that's down here. And then it is going to get thinner as it moves away from the source. So let's talk about the characteristics of blood droplets that allow it to behave this way. So a blood droplet will remain spherical in space until it collides with a surface. The spherical shape is caused by the surface tension of the blood. Blood has a very high surface tension. So you can see in this image here, our blood droplet is falling, it is spherical in shape, and then it gets kind of pushed outwards, creating that circle as it falls. Now, we can look at the shape of the blood droplet and determine the angle of impact, something else we talked about you can get from blood spatter. If it's perfectly round, that means it fell straight down at about a 90 degree angle. If it is more elliptical, meaning oval in shape, that means that it is at some sort of angle and it's going to elongate, meaning become more oval as we move from 90 to zero degrees. So at 80 degrees, it's still pretty circular but at 10 degrees, it is a very long oval. And you can see that happening in the diagram down at the bottom. Now we can actually mathematically calculate the angle of impact by doing some pretty simple trick. Your calculator does need to be in degrees in order to do this. All of my calculators that you will have available on test day will already be in degrees, but if you're ever using your own personal calculator for work, it is important to know. And that formula is the inverse sine width divided by height. Once again, please make sure your calculator is in degrees. So in an example problem, you would look at the blood droplet and you measure the width, that side to side is three millimeters and the length up and down is five millimeters. Now you will notice I did not include the tail in my measurements and you never do include the tail. You do the largest oval you can, but excluding the tail. Then I would enter it in as inverse sine three divided by five. And my calculator and your calculator too, if you're working along with me, would tell you that it is 37 degrees. Now something else we said we could determine from a spatter pattern was the origin of the blood. And we do that through what are called lines of convergence. So you essentially take each individual blood droplet and draw straight lines down the axis of the blood spatter. So the direction they came from, you draw a line towards that direction. And where all the lines converge is where the blood originated from, meaning that is likely where the person was standing when they started to bleed. Now you will notice as shown in the picture, you are not going to get everything to one perfect point, and that's because people take up an area. So they might be bleeding from multiple locations or may have moved slightly. So we end up kind of with an 
area, not one specific spot. And this brings us how we're going to determine the point of origin, not just the area of origin, the actual point. So you place a stand on the area of convergence. There are many different types of stands that are used, but typically you want one that can become the height of a human. Then you calculate the angle of impact for each stain. So if there are 100 um, spatters, you're going to calculate the angle of impact for each one, which does mean measuring the width and the height of each one. So it is a laborious process. Then using string tape and a protractor, you raise the string to the calculated angle and attach it to the stand. So you'd go to the blood droplet, tape a string to it, move it up to the angle, and then take that string all the way to the stand and tie it off. And you're going to repeat that process for every single droplet. The place on the stand where the strings from each stain meets is going to be our area of origin. So. This tells us not only in a two-dimensional way where the blood came from, this is showing us in a three-dimensional way where on the body likely the blood came from. And this can be very important if we do not have a victim or we are trying to identify how our suspect may have become injured in the process so we can alert like emergency rooms to be on the lookout for someone coming in needing stitches on their arm, for example. So... This process, while taking a lot of time, can yield very valuable information. So that was a lot of blood spatter, and we're going to be using it in class and I think having a lot of fun with it along the way. So come to class ready to learn more.